All right, we're going to start off with a song. Feel free to sing with me. You know the song. considering it's June and baseball season is well underway. Well, this song actually takes me back to last year when I was at a baseball game with my family. We were at a Cubs game. It was actually a beautiful day and we were enjoying the weather. And when it came time to sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game, we all stood and we started to sing along. And as we did this, I looked out at the crowd and I noticed how many people were swaying side to side when they sang this song. As a music therapist, I wasn't particularly surprised to see this, but I love pointing out fun facts about music to my family. So after the song was over, I turned to my brother and I said, hey, don't you think it's interesting that most people sway side to side when they sing this song? And he looked at me and he said, no. <laughs> they're swaying because they're drunk. <laughs> and I said, okay, maybe there's something to that. But did you know that there's actually a neurological explanation for the reason why people move that way to this particular song? Well, he wasn't very interested in my neurological explanation, so he just went back on to enjoying the game. But you see, as a music therapist, I've studied the way that music impacts our brains and our bodies and our behavior. And I love pointing out fun facts that demystify what people believe are unexplainable reactions to music. So many times other therapists have come to me and said, you wouldn't believe the way my clients respond when I play music. Or someone would say, you should see the way my mother reacts when she hears this song. People seem to perceive music as a single stimulus that's almost magical and don't really know that there are reasons for the ways that we respond to music. You see, Music therapists understand this. They know how to shape clinical experiences to create certain neurological responses and help individuals heal. But when people come to me and they're really excited about this, I try to validate that and I say, yes, music is so powerful. Isn't it amazing the way that it impacts us? But this is not magic. This is science. Music therapy is a broad field. We work with a wide range of individuals to address a multitude of concerns. But today I would like to talk specifically about how music therapy can be used to help improve movement and the role that rhythm plays in this process. But first, we have to go back and review some basic musical elements. Now in Western culture, most of the time when we hear a piece of music, we can generally sense an underlying pulse. This is something that we can feel. That pulse is made audible by instruments. Typically, percussion instruments do this. And then, we have a beat. Something we can hear and we can clap along with. Then we count how many beats take place in a minute, and that gives us our tempo. Tempo describes how fast or slow a piece of music is. Now, some beats are accented, and that's what organizes them into what we call measures. Sometimes we have four beats in a measure, sometimes three. When we have four beats in a measure, we hear one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. The first beat is accented. This is four, four time. This is our meter. When we have three beats in a measure, it sounds like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's our three, four time. Now there's many other different types of time signatures and they start to get more and more complicated. But 3-4 and 4-4 meter are the two we probably hear most often when we listen to a piece of music. Now depending on the way 
beats are organized in a piece of music, depending on the meter, we will actually feel compelled to move in different ways. Think about the song Piano Man by Billy Joel. Sing us a song, you're the piano man. Sing us a song tonight. Well, we're all in the mood for a melody, and you've got us feeling all right. Now, I was a wedding singer for a number of years, and the band that I performed with provided the entertainment at wedding receptions. No matter where we performed, no matter the age of the bride and groom, and no matter the culture that they represented, whenever we played this song, people always responded the same way. They put their arms around each other, and they swayed side to side. Piano Man has a 3-4 feel to it. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's actually in 6-8 time, but 6-8 time has that 3-4 feeling. And 3-4 is our sway meter. Take me out to the ball game is in 3-4. But why do we move that way to this song? Well, consider the fact that our movements are naturally rhythmic. Think about the way that we walk. We have a steady beat when we walk. And there's actually a rhythm you can hear, especially when you wear heels, right? Bum, 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 bum. Some of our movements are accented, just like beats are accented in music. Some of them are bigger and they take more force than the other movements. In walking, you hear almost a two, four time signature, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two. So when music is organized in a particular way and beats are accented, we feel compelled to move in a way that matches that same organization. Let's sing another song. This land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island. I don't really want to sway to this song, but I might want to march to it or clap my hands. This song is in 4-4 four, four time. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. This land was made for you and me. You can feel quite a difference between these two songs. And yes, they're pretty drastic examples, but these are two songs in two different meters where beats are organized and accented differently. And we want to move differently to these two songs. Now let's talk about rhythm. We have our beat. Some beats are accented and we're in 4-4 four, four time. Now we're going to layer a pattern on top of this. Our rhythm. But you can still hear our meter underneath. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The underlying beat and the meter remain pretty consistent, while the rhythm can continue to change. Now, a percussion instrument might play the rhythm, a pitched instrument might play the rhythm, or a vocalist might come in and sing a melody with the rhythm. You could have multiple rhythms in the same piece of music layered on top of each other. Think about what we've discussed so far. We've talked about three musical elements, tempo, meter, and rhythm. You're starting to see how complex music really is. It's not a single stimulus. Instead, it's a collection of many different musical elements layered on top of each other. Music is complicated. And because it's so complex, it activates many different parts of our brain at the same time. Our brains have to process all of these musical elements simultaneously. But what happens in our brain when we hear a steady external auditory cue like the beat? Well, the first thing that happens is the sound travels through our ears and we hear it. Then it's processed in the auditory cortex. We make sense of what it is that we're hearing. And then something fascinating happens. Our brains actually start to synchronize with this external auditory cue. Now, if you ever have a chance to look at somebody's brain under an fMRI while they're listening to music, you will see that the brain actually lights up or is activated in time with the music the person is listening to. 
you will see many different areas of the brain activated, and you will see this activity level fluctuate based on what's happening in the music. We are synchronizing. Now, because of the close association between the auditory centers of our brain and the motor centers, our muscles are actually activated and we are primed for movement. They're being sent signals to move, move, move in time with the music just by listening to it. Inside, we are synchronizing. Even if we're not the best dancers and we don't do a good job of keeping the beat, Inside, we are synchronizing. I'm sure many of you have had the experience of tapping your toe or moving your body to music and you sort of catch yourself, you didn't realize you were doing that. Because we are so wired to move when we listen to music with a strong rhythmic pulse, it almost becomes an involuntary reaction to music, something we're not even aware that we're doing. Do you see why music therapists would get really excited about this? If just by listening to music, your brain is telling your body to move, then imagine what can happen when we design music and shape it in certain ways to facilitate specific movements in therapy. Well, Dr. Michael Taub from Colorado State University has conducted an abundant amount of research in the area of music in the brain. And he's also looked closely at rhythm and the role that it plays in our movement. His research began in individuals who had Parkinson's disease because these people generally have a great amount of difficulty initiating movement, they have problems with balance and coordination, and we see deficits in their gait. What he discovered was that this external auditory cueing actually facilitated the timing of movement. And he began to see dramatic results in the subjects that participated in his research. They were improving the speed at which they were walking. They were taking longer strides when they were walking, and their balance and their coordination improved. His research has been replicated many times, and it's expanded a great deal. And based on the results, Dr. Tout created a technique called Rhythmic Auditory Stimulation, or RAS. And this technique was designed to help individuals with Parkinson's disease improve their gait. It's implemented by a music therapist and a physical therapist who work in close collaboration together. And the process begins with an individual assessment where the music therapist determines the client's tempo by watching them walk from one point to another. They have a specific way of doing this and a formula that they use to calculate beats per minute by watching the client walk and also looking at the quality of their movement. After this baseline tempo is established, the therapist decides if the tempo should be increased or decreased in therapy sessions, depending on what it is the client needs to work on. Now sometimes, people with Parkinson's disease take short, quick steps. They're moving quickly, but they're not getting anywhere very quickly. In those instances, the music therapist would decide to decrease the tempo to allow the client to slow down and support them in taking longer strides, walking a little more slowly. And then they provide music to really shape and support that movement because this takes a little bit more effort. In other instances, clients are trying to improve the speed at which they're walking, so the music therapist increases the tempo for therapy. Now we have seen outstanding results using rhythmic auditory stimulation with this population. But now we use this technique with a wide range of individuals who have different types of motor concerns. And rhythmic auditory stimulation is actually the guiding principle that underlies many different types of music therapy interventions when we're helping individuals to improve their motor skills. But the research with Parkinson's disease has shown that RAS can actually yield results that sustain themselves for up until one month after treatment is over. This is pretty significant when we're talking about Parkinson's because this disease is progressive in nature. So what this means is that the brain is actually making changes in the way that it operates during the music therapy session. And those changes are sustaining themselves so that the brain is learning to function in a new way even outside of the musical environment. But how does this work? How does rhythm actually help us to improve our movement? Well, researchers are still looking very closely at this question. They want to know exactly what's happening neurologically during this process. One theory 
is that this external auditory cueing actually activates compensatory neural networks in the brain. And these networks take on the job of facilitating movement. This is essentially the principle of neuroplasticity. Healthy areas of the brain are recruited to take over the functions of those areas that are no longer working efficiently. But RAS is not the only technique in music therapy that can help facilitate neuroplasticity. Because music activates so many different parts of the brain, just by listening to it or engaging in music making experiences, music therapy has tremendous potential for healing. The intentional use of music by a trained clinician, a board certified music therapist, can have outstanding results. Music therapy has been shown to improve memory, communication, cognitive abilities, social skills, and even to help find new ways to cope with anxiety and depression. But this is not a new form of therapy. Music therapy has been an established profession since the 1950s. But we as humans, we've been using music to heal for centuries. Many people have found music to be therapeutic to themselves in some way whether it's helping them to relax or energizing them for a strenuous workout. Music moves us, both physically and emotionally. So the next time you find yourself confronted with a particular health concern, stop for a minute and think, how might music be my medicine? Thank you.